As president of the International March of the Living, I am proud that it is our mission to remember the past, reflect in the present on our hopes and dreams for the future, and try to make a difference for the next generations of not only the Jewish people, but of all humanity everywhere. It is with this in mind that I personally invite you to join us as we shine a light on the darkness of hate. Good evening. My name is Paul Miller, and I want to welcome everyone to tonight's special broadcast. If tonight's program only dealt with the memory of Kristallnacht, it would be important enough for everyone to watch. Kristallnacht, as we all know, took place over eight decades ago, November 9, 1938, when Jews and Jewish institutions across Germany and Austria were attacked by a paramilitary organ of the Nazi party, sanctioned by the German government which ushered in the horror of the Holocaust. But tonight's program also brings us a fuller understanding of what the world is facing today. Attacks on communities and institutions by the ultra-right and the extreme left, which bear the all too familiar actions and slogans of the past. Tonight's program, therefore, is not merely important, it is crucial. People around the world cannot merely stand by as happened in the 1930s, and allow us once again to slip into the atrocities of the past. If anyone has a doubt about the reality of what is happening today, one example should dispel all doubt. Not eight decades ago, rather only one month ago, state and federal law enforcement authorities exposed, broke up, and indicted members of an ultra-right organization connected to a plot to attack the capital of the state of Michigan, kidnap, try and kill the governor. These kinds of people are terrorists and their actions must be understood for what they really are and what they stand for. I would now like to thank our presenters who remind us about the evil that was Kristallnacht and bring us a fuller understanding of what the world is facing today. Our partner, the International March of the Living, not merely for tonight's program, but for the work they have been doing for decades to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive. And two special people who are not usually seen, but without whose work tonight's presentation would not have been possible. David Macklis and Ellie Rubenstein. Finally, I want to extend a special thanks to the Jewish Broadcasting System for enabling this special presentation to be seen and heard over its network, which serves between 500,000 and 600,000 people monthly and globally throughout Europe and Israel online. It is now my pleasure to turn tonight's presentation over to my friend, Richard Heidemann, who will chair this special program. Thank you, Paul, for your inspiring words and for all the important work the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience at Rutgers University does in fighting racism, hatred, and intolerance. And of course, thank you for your most generous support of the International March of the Living and for tonight's commemoration of Kristallnacht. As Paul referenced in his opening remarks, 82 years ago, beginning on November 9th, 1938, the night of broken glass, the world first gained an inkling of the savage intentions of Hitler and the Nazis. Kristallnacht turned out to be a grim foreshadowing of what was to happen to the rest of Europe's Jews. In two days, at the direct order of Nazi leaders, over 7,000 Jewish-owned stores and synagogues were ransacked their glass shattered all over the streets of Germany and Austria, and scores of Jews were murdered. Over 30,000 German Jews were arrested and sent to concentration camps. By the end of World War II, an estimated six million Jews and millions of other innocent victims all across Europe lost their lives at the hands of Nazi Germany. Sadly, the same hatred and extremism that was witnessed on the streets of Germany 
in the 1930s, the same anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance today may be found all over the world, including right here in the United States. Which is why the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience at Rutgers University, the Jüdisch Gemeinde Frankfurt M, and the International March of the Living have partnered to bring you this special program commemorating the 82nd anniversary of the Evening of Kristallnacht. This commemoration is part of a larger campaign that has been launched by the March of the Living called Let There Be Light, where individuals, institutions, and houses of worship around the world were invited to keep their lights on during the night of November 9th as a symbol of solidarity and mutual commitment in the shared battle against anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, and intolerance. As part of this virtual initiative, people from all over the world, of all religions and backgrounds, are invited to write personal messages of hope in their own words at the campaign website, motl.org slash let there be light. Included among the many venerable places of worship being illuminated this evening are the main synagogue in Frankfurt, Germany, one of the few synagogues not destroyed on Kristallnacht, and the old city walls in Jerusalem. Against the backdrop of rising anti-Semitism, racism, and the shadow of the coronavirus, these expressions of optimism and unity will help illuminate the world against darkness and hatred. On behalf of the International March of the Living and its partners, we thank you for joining us. We continue this evening's program with a moving rendition of the Holocaust era song, Es Brent. Es Brent, which means it's burning, was written by Polish-Jewish-Yiddish poet Mordechai Gebertig in response to a 1936 pogrom in the Polish town of Pszczyktyk. In June 1942, Gebertig was murdered by German soldiers. Cantor Aviva Reisky, a child of a Holocaust survivor, will now perform as Brent. Cantor Reisky conducted the March of the Living Choir in 2015 in Auschwitz-Birkenau on Yom HaShoah. Before I sing Esbrent, I'd like to share that I am standing in front of the Holocaust Memorial Wall at Congregation Habonim in Toronto. This was the first synagogue in Canada founded by Holocaust survivors, many of whom were first-hand witnesses to Kristallnacht. Es brennt, Brüder lacht, es brennt. Oi, unser Arm steht und nebach brennt. Beise winden mit Ergossen, Reisen brechen und zerblossen. Starker Nacht, die wilde Flammen, als er umschauen brennt. Und er steht und kocht es euch mit verlegter Hand. Und er steht und kocht es euch unser Städte brennt. It burns, brothers, it burns. Our push dental pitifully now burns. Angry winds with rage and curses, tears and shatters and disperses. Wild flames leap, they twist and turn. Everything now burns. And you stand there looking on. And 
hands folded and palms upturned and you stand there looking on while our shtetl burns Mit verlegter Hand And you stand there looking on While our shtetl burn Es brennt, Brederle Es brennt A central pillar of Holocaust education is survivor testimony. For a number of years now, the International March of the Living has worked together with the USC Shoah Foundation in the sacred effort of preserving Holocaust survivor testimony. We applaud the important work and appreciate the USC Shoah Foundation for having shared with us from their archives of over 54,000 testimonies collected since the mid-1990s, a number of first-hand accounts of Holocaust survivors who were also personal witnesses to the horrific events of Kristallnacht. All of a sudden, we saw a little flickering light Mind you, there was no light in the temple. It was all, it was all, they were smashing. And then the flames got bigger. And the flames got bigger. And the flames got bigger. And then the flames started coming to the side of the building. And then they started shooting out to the side of the building, to the windows. These are beautiful windows. And you've got to remember, there were chandeliers in there. They were made out of crystal. They were made out of this very expensive material. It was a beautiful synagogue. It was a, a masterpiece of workmanship. The, the temple in the, in the, in the, in, in the Oranienburger Straße. Beautiful synagogue. And then the flames got bigger. And you could hear the glass just pop. And you could also hear the crystal sort of crack and shoot like a bullet coming at you. But you could hear it, bing, 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 like this continuously. And she brought me into the house and we locked the doors. And it was around 11 o'clock. And my grandmother was in the kitchen cutting up the cake that she had baked and had made some hand cheese. There were a group of men dressed in the uniform, the black, um, the green uniforms. They were not the black uniforms at that time. They knocked down the door with an ax. They threw bricks into the windows and then they came in. They destroyed everything that they could see. They went into the kitchen, they knocked down the flour and the sugar, the cheese that my grandmother had made, and then made a mess on the kitchen floor. And then one of them, can't figure it out, urinated on top of all of this garbage and then took his hand and spread it all over the kitchen. Another one went after my sister, and that's when my grandmother took things into her own hands. They took all the feather pillows, they took all the linens, they threw them out of the window, and all of the people in the town were downstairs outside collecting all of the things that were thrown out the window and taking them home. Um, the only thing that survived was a sewing machine that had been covered up with some kind of a white cloth. 
There wasn't a chair left in the house. There wasn't a mattress. The mattresses they threw out the window. There wasn't a bed left in the house. And there wasn't a window that wasn't broken. And this was in November. There were 30 SR. Do you know what SR? They, but not in uniform. They all wore civilian clothes, but we knew them. How did you know what they were? Because some of them were from the village, and the rest were, were strangers. But when we saw the ones from the village, of course, we knew then. They had access. And again, it was my mother who said afterwards, these axes had brand new handles, so it was prepared because Dr. Goebbels got on uh, the radio the next day and said, this was totally unprepared. We had nothing to do with it. The people did it. And my mother said, uh-uh, brand new handles for the, anyhow, they, they actually uh, uh, hit through those iron uh, shades uh, everywhere. And then they broke down huge wooden front uh, doors and they came in. And my father came downstairs. He had put on pants over his nightshirt. And somehow I can see ourselves, the three of us, standing in the hallway against the wall. I stood on the first step upstairs, then my mother, then my father. And they came by us and started in the kitchen. And everything was demolished, broken, with the, with the axes. There was no window left. There was a knock at the door. And it was not usual, you know, for people to knock. And I put the chain on Gestapo in civvies. Where's your father? No idea. He, I said, uh, he is not here, and you know, I had to open. And I remember the chutzpah, show me your IDs. <laughs> I said to them, I was 11, 10 years old, 11 years old, show me your IDs. And these guys pushed some kind of badge through the slit, and then of course I had to let them in. And they looked, and they went, we had feather beds in the bath, in the bedrooms, and uh, it was winter, it was a very cold winter that year. And they went into the bedroom and uh, took out knives and slit the feather beds. And I remember saying, are you expecting my father to be hiding in the bed? I mean, I don't know where the chutzpah came from. And they shoved me around and said, you shut up. And uh, anyway, they obviously, I don't know what they were looking for. And then they left, and I tried to push the feathers back into the bed. Then eventually my mother came back and said, Eric, my cousin, and my uncle had been taken to the concentration camp. Last week, the International March of the Living had the opportunity to interview and record the testimony of Norbert Strauss and his own first-hand account of the events of Kristallnacht. Here is a portion of that interview. My name is Norbert Strauss. I was born in Germany in a small town named Bad Homburg, north of Frankfurt. I will be relating to you my remembrances about the Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass, November 9th, 1938. Middle of the night, while everybody was sleeping, all of a sudden we hear a loud banging on the door. My father gets up, opens up the door, there are a couple of policemen and a couple of uh, black uniform, which is the SS, which is called Sondersturm, and they demand that all men 16 and over come with them. The only ones who were, the only ones who were men who were over 16 was my uncle and my father. They quickly, under pressure from the police, left without even taking a winter coat with them. In November, it's already cold in Germany. They were taken to a large hall called Festhalle in Frankfurt, something like Madison Square Garden, where there are exhibitions and uh, so on throughout the year. 
thousands of Jewish men were brought in, not only from Frankfurt, but from also in the, the neighborhood. And they were kept there under very strenuous, terrible conditions. No food. If you wanted to go to the bathroom, you had to run the gauntlet of SS troops who would beat up everybody. After a few days, we understand that my father and the others were shipped off to the concentration camp uh, Buchenwald. Later in the morning, after we had come back home again, my brother and I decided we had not heard anything about school and we went by bicycle. It was the only safe way to go is by bicycle because otherwise you could be caught by the Hitler youth and they would love to beat up any Jewish boy they could find. So we went on our bicycles and started going towards school. We come about halfway towards school to a famous intersection called Urtürmchen, little clock tower, and we stopped there. Why did we stop? We look in front of us, about a half a block away, was one of the two Orthodox synagogues going up in flames. The fire was shooting out of the windows. The fire department was there, but only to make sure that the buildings to the left and the right and the back would not catch fire. They made no attempt to put out the fire in the synagogue. Later in the day, uh, my f uh, father and all the other men uh, got on trains and they shipped to Buchenwald. After a while, my mother found out that there was a way of getting the men out of the concentration camp. You had to meet four conditions. Number one, you had to have been a frontline soldier in the First World War. That was fine. My father had been in the artillery uh, in the, on the French uh, border. Number two, you had agreed to be out of Germany within six months. That was more difficult because my father at this point had no idea where to go, but he said, yes, he will. Number three, he had to sell his business for pennies and a dollar under duress, and my father agreed to that. And number four, you had to agree to turn over all your life insurance policies, the policies on his wife, my mother, my brother, and I, for the benefit of the state. All the accumulated cash values were lost, the state took it over. My father agreed to everything, and exactly four weeks after he had been arrested, he came home, we were all standing on the sidewalk waiting for him to come because we had been told that he was coming. If I had not known that this was my father, I would not have recognized him. He was dirty, disheveled, the hair on his head was shaved, the beard was grown, his clothing to the extent that he still had it uh, was dirty and torn, but he was glad to be home and naturally immediately started working on a way of getting out, to, out of Germany within six months, as he had promised he would. He was finally able to buy a landing pass to Cuba. And uh, in May 1939, just about six months after he had come home from concentration camp, he left on the famous St. Louis. That is the end of my story about the Kristallnacht. I would now like to call upon Professor John J. Farmer, Jr. 
director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics of Rutgers University and the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience within the Institute. John is an esteemed lawyer and dear friend of the International March of the Living, with whom we have worked on a number of important initiatives. The former Attorney General of New Jersey, John Farmer brings to us his experience, his expertise, and his commitment to seeking justice. Thank you, Richard, and good evening, everybody. On August 13, 1920, when Adolf Hitler made his first public anti-Semitic speech titled Why We Are Against the Jews, and the Nazi Party boasted a membership of exactly 60 people. Few, if anyone, even Hitler himself, could have foreseen the monstrous tale and consequences of his hate-filled words. Like Osama bin Laden's declaration of war against the United States delivered from a remote cave in Afghanistan by a seemingly marginal eccentric, Hitler stated, quote, thorough solution, the removal of the Jews from the, from the midst of our people, was essentially dismissed at the time it was issued. In retrospect, both seemed chillingly prophetic. The slaughter that was the Holocaust ended with the murder over a four-year period of six million Jews and by some estimates almost as many others deemed undesirable. But this attempted genocide on an industrial scale began a quarter century earlier with the ravings of an irrelevant madman and proceeded in graduated and gradually accelerating steps toward the final solution. On August 3, 1921, Hitler took those first steps by establishing a militia, the SA or Brown Shirts, the storm section of the party, whose purpose was to take the offensive at any given moment in attacking Jews and communists deemed the principal opponents of Nazism. The Nazis then turned to the recruitment of young people, forming the Hitler Youth Movement in July 1926 to impress upon the young the ideal of racial purity. The party turned from harassment to murder on New Year's Day 1930 when the brown shirt militia killed eight Jews. And in the early 1930s, as the party tried to build its base of support, there was open violence in the streets as the brown shirt militias battled their leftist communist counterparts, whom they frequently identified as Jews. But the pace of persecution accelerated with the accession of Hitler to the chancellorship in 1933. The brown shirts gained official status when Hitler appointed 50,000 of them as auxiliary police. A police raid on Communist Party headquarters turned up false planning documents targeting public buildings. Within a month, Hitler used the mysterious arson of the Reichstag fire as a pretext to arrest communist leadership, crush communist opposition, and consolidate his power. In the wake of the fire, at a meeting of the German Bar Association, 10,000 German lawyers took an oath of personal loyalty to Hitler, no longer to the Weimar Republic. This effectively ended the rule of law in Germany. Courts became tools for implementation of National Socialism. By April 1933, all Bar Association business was conducted under the supervision of the SA. The Nazis assaulted all the instrumentalities of liberal democracy. The press was assailed as an enemy of the people and eventually silenced. Books deemed degenerate by the Nazis were burned, 20,000 at one time in Berlin. Non-Aryan scientists like Albert Einstein were exiled. With the leftists and communists crushed, the opposition press silenced, leading intellectuals marginalized, and the lawyers and judges enlisted, the Nazis turned their attention fully to the legal destruction of the Jews. Among the measures adopted eliminating Jewish legal personhood in Germany were the following. A law for the restoration of the civil service in 1933, which banned Jews from representing Aryans and from participating in the civil service, including teaching. A people's court established to punish enemies of the people, most of whom turned out to be Jewish. There was a law passed to revoke German citizenship for Jews. Jews were also barred from all athletic and sporting associations, excluded from the Reich Chamber of Culture, banned from working on German newspapers or appearing on stage or screen. Jewish companies were barred from mention on radio. Jews were barred from taking a bar examination. Jewish newspapers were banned. Jews were barred from serving in the armed forces. The 1935 Nuremberg Laws, signed by Hitler himself, barred citizenship for Jews and any non-Aryans. People with Jewish names could no longer use them sending, even sending telegrams. A law prohibiting mixed marriages prohibited Jews from marrying Aryans. A secret directive of 1937 commanded press protective custody for all defilers of the German race. Finally, in 1938, the law was passed requiring the Jews to change their family names so that it sounded less Jewish and forbade Jews from practicing law or medicine. Another 1938 ordinance barred Jews from participating at all in the, in the German economy and participating in all cultural functions. 
Jewish children were forbidden from attending schools. German students were taught that, quote, the Jew is our greatest enemy. All Jewish businesses were required to be sold in 1938. The German government eventually required Jews to wear a yellow star, revoked Jewish passports, limited the use of public transportation, excluded them from participation in the press and radio, and ultimately required the Jews to be resettled in concentration camps. In short, before the systematic physical extermination of the Jews began, they had suffered an extermination of legal personhood and a withering torrent of anti-Semitic messaging, vandalism, beatings, isolated killings, boycotts, and propaganda. As one historian put it, the dagger of the assassin was concealed beneath the robe of the jurist until Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was the event that brought the dagger fully out from under the robe. It was the event in which hatred migrated permanently across the brain-blood barrier of extremism and became open and state-sponsored violence. As David Frum has put it, quote, through the end of 1937, it remained possible to hope that the Nazi persecution might still respect some last limits of humanity. Surely, in an advanced and cultured nation, some decency must still constrain uttermost barbarity. On Kristallnacht, the last of those illusions was smashed like broken glass, close quote. Retaliating for the murder of a German diplomat in Paris by a Polish Jew who was angered by his parents' deportation, Hitler ordered a, quote, night of terror, close quote, throughout Germany, Austria, and the recently acquired Sudetenland. The Nazis unleashed a storm of destruction and murder on November 9, 1938, that signaled a decisive turn toward state-sponsored violence. Synagogues, shops, homes were vandalized and burned in the thousands. Over 90 Jews were murdered, countless others beaten. The police stood by and watched where they didn't actively participate themselves. 20,000 Jews were seized and sent to concentration camps at Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen. Several hundred died at the hands of the guards in those early days. On January 30, 1939, Hitler gave another speech. Reacting to international outrage over Kristallnacht, he said that even if Germany found itself at war, quote, the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thus a victory for Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. We see it now in retrospect. After Kristallnacht, the course was set. As Paul Miller mentioned in his welcoming remarks, that history alone would be worth commemorating tonight. That history also urges us to look closely at the world we confront today, at the way vulnerable populations are treated, at the persistence of hate and the many forms of its expression, and at the efforts of extremist groups to move from marginal players to mainstream actors. The protection of vulnerable populations is the purpose of the Miller Center at Rutgers. We have worked with communities as diverse as the Muslim community in Brussels and the Jewish community in Whitefish, Montana, the African-American community in Louisiana and Mississippi, and the Sikh community in Wisconsin. In seeking to assist these very different communities, we have been struck by a common thread and a common threat the increasing use of social media and the cyber world as a means of recruitment, incitement, and dissemination of hatred toward and violence against vulnerable populations. We were therefore privileged to have been asked to partner earlier this year with Dr. Joel Finkelstein, James Madison Fellow at Princeton, also now a senior research fellow at the Miller Center, and the Network Contagion Research Institute <coughs> he leads. Together, we have written groundbreaking reports exposing the emergence of the right-wing militia Boogaloo Boys and predicting its potential for violence, the rise in anti-Asian hatred in the wake of the pandemic, the emergence of extreme leftist anarcho-socialist violence, the insidious propagation of QAnon conspiracy theories, and most recently, a report on the new face of anti-Semitism emerging on social media. The extremists Joel will describe spreading hate over social media may be small in number and marginalized for the moment, but the example of Kristallnacht should arrest any temptation to dismiss them. For just as Kristallnacht and what followed resulted from intensely controlled and intensifying messaging of hateful propaganda, so the extremism of today is the product of a social media environment that reinforces every form of prejudice, that converts general proclivities to fixed convictions. And our work has shown that when the messaging of hate reaches a peak of intensity, murderous violence erupts, as in the attack on the mosque in New Zealand, or the synagogue in Pittsburgh, or the killing of law enforcement officers in California. The only answer to such hate is light, the light of truth, the truth that shames every form of hate. Joel's work shines that kind of light. Now he will share that kind of truth. Good evening. My name is Joel Finkelstein. I'm the director of the Network Contagion Research Institute. 
We're an organization that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to try to understand what's happening on social media at a massive scale. We use quantitative methods to understand the contagions that occur with bad ideas within and between web communities and how those increasingly are influencing the real world. So the talk that I'm here to give you today is about methods to monitor, combat, and expose anti-Semitism as it's growing on social media. And this is becoming an increasingly large problem in this medium. Now, the story that we are telling starts really back in 2018, when we began using these approaches to understand what was happening with hate and malicious deceit on web communities. And it started with some extremist communities, 4chan, Gab, some that most of you are probably blessed to have never heard of. These are communities with millions of members, and they espouse really bad ideas about white supremacy, anti-Semitism, using code words and memes. In September of 2018, we noticed these communities, and using our tools, we diagnosed what they were like. We explored their coded language, their strange dreams of, of white supremacist control and genocide. And we published a report in the Washington Post warning that we were witnessing a massive spillout of white supremacy and anti-Semitism in these communities. And we were noticing a worrying trend in our report between real world activity mirroring this kind of online rhetoric. We saw that in, in consecutive real world events, the election, the inauguration, and then Charlottesville, our tools detected massive changes in the way that these large communities of hateful individuals were speaking. Increases in identity politics, blame towards Jews and African Americans and other minorities. And a month later, Pittsburgh happened. The attack at Pittsburgh actually came from one of the communities that we were studying, Gab. It was motivated by the ideas we were referring to in the Washington Post mere weeks before the attack occurred, talking about this worrying mirroring between these online communities. And now we were watching terror attacks where attackers were preparing their memes at the same time that they're preparing their attacks. Fast forward about a month later, and we noticed that one of the memes that we saw, this, this Pepe the Frog character, the frog appeared on, on this, this strange military patch. And we immediately knew that what we were witnessing was a very dangerous evolution. Individuals going from hotbeds where, where terrible ideas and dangerous ideologies were being hotboxed and, and emerging into the real world, now we were seeing entire militias that were emerging on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Reddit. The militia was called the Boogaloo. It's an apocalyptic militia cult seeking an Armageddon and a battle and insurgency against law enforcement officials and policymakers. It turns out that there's elements of racial war that are attached to this idea, and that the plan across the entire militia is to use memes and code words to foment violence across the entire country. In March, we warned about this in a story that was at the top of NBC News, warning of imminent attacks from this group based on what we had seen in Pittsburgh that were, that were imminent towards law enforcement, towards civilians. Fast forward a month after that, and we saw these groups showing up everywhere at quarantine. Instead of brown shirts, they were wearing Hawaiian shirts. But the accelerationist flair, the racial overtones, the, the ideas of accelerating a massive war, those were familiar enough. And soon we saw this group not just appearing across these, these rallies, but storming government buildings and then launching numerous lethal terror attacks against law enforcement. Our tools, it turned out, were capable of threat analysis and landscape prediction. Only a month after that, the NCRI issued a report on what we called network-enabled anarchy. We saw the rise of anarchist and communist militia groups all across Twitter, all across Reddit, and on Facebook again. The networks that we noticed were launching their own sets of code words and memes, this time dehumanizing police and political opponents. They were calling for a revolution, just like the Boogaloo. They were using memes to organize it, just like the Boogaloo. And we found that they were using these, re these memes to organize riots in five major US cities, Richmond, Oakland, Eugene, Seattle, and Portland, simultaneously coordinating them online with chilling new abilities that social media was offering these accelerationist groups, burning down police precincts, throwing explosive at the sides of police buildings, throwing Molotov cocktails into, into cars loaded with officers. 
we noticed a massive contagion inside of web communities similar to Gab's and 4chan's on the right, but this time on the left. And they had revolutionary ideas, explicitly violent ideas, and, and stockpiling ammunition and preparing for an all-out war. Okay, what's happening here? It would appear that very bad ideologies from the 1900s are returning. This time, they're returning on social media, and they're disguising themselves with cartoonish jokes, code words, and glorification of genocidal dictators as a joke. They're focused on the hatred of Jews as immigrants, worried about a white replacement where Jews will come in as immigrants, and they will replace all white people with ethnic people of color. On the other side, you have the resurgence of other bad ideas from the 1900s. These two are glorifying genocidal dictators with inside jokes. And they're talking about Jews replacing people of color, this time using a nation. That's the opposite of the first myth, except it's completely inverted and identical otherwise. You have other pockets of people getting in on this action and using social media. The black Hebrew Israelites, with the recent violence in the Northeastern Corridor against Jewish life. Motivated by the idea, again, that Jews are replacing them and using memes and cartoonish code words all across social media in similar ways. And finally, you have grievances in the Middle East that are also promoting their own ideas of replacement. And they're preparing their memes at the same time they prepare their rocket attacks. All right, this is a pandemic. In tandem with COVID-19 and the massive social instability that has followed in its wake, a pandemic of anti-Semitic memes and ideas are circulating all over the world. They're disguised in the same way through code words and inside jokes as cartoons and images hotboxed inside of web communities that target individual users with ads that pull them into tribal communities. Those communities are pulling out conspiracy theories to organize their grievances. These conspiracy theories are filled with code words and images. We see these causing riots and real world events that are, that are excused because of the conspiracies and cause real world episodes of violence. The violence we see in our own tools is extremely powerful for producing a massive cascade of images and of code words across these social media communities. And finally, this is a kind of ecosystem that is very rich for disruption by state actors who seek to inject all of these things sporadically into such a toxic mixture. In that environment, our media, our leadership are incapable of having honest conversations with us because every single side is weaponizing language with increasingly coded words that mean violence and putting political violence back on the menu in ways that haven't been seen since the 1900s. So what can we do about this? We developed a platform that allows us to go through these communities rapidly and dissect what's in them at a massive scale. And what does this allow? It allows us to dissect the code words. We can see what the ethnic disgust is. We can see what the cryptic disguises towards Jews, what, what the global control accusations are made of, and how they're being set out as supernatural forms of evil and dominance. Okay? We can see when the riots are, are happening and the escalating violence and the language that's preceding them. We can see when the terror attacks are ensuing and when the code words are coming forward. We can see them populating the networks that, that are filled with the radicals that are emerging from them to, to engage in acts of stochastic terror in the real world. And we can capture the images using machine learning analysis as well. We can capture the conspiracy theories. We can see them playing out across all these communities simultaneously, being sh uh, shared between them rapidly. And we can see the state actors using those same tools in real time, injecting anti-Semitic speech into the communities during terror attacks like Charlottesville or during the election itself. The only question now is, will we be aware of this? Will we look at this straight? Will we look at this in the eye? And will we deal with this as both for the sake of the Jewish people and for the sake of our democracies everywhere? We are now pleased to welcome Happy Hoffman, who is a musical leader who's been with us for many years on the March of the Living.
As grave as the events of Kristallnacht were, they paled in comparison to the events that were to unfold in the years to follow after the outbreak of World War II, which culminated in the Shoah, the Holocaust, an unprecedented event in the history of the world. This evening, we will hear from one of our cherished survivors of those terrible years, Irving Roth, whose eloquent testimony has been shared on the March of the Living with many thousands of people, young and old alike, and in numerous other educational settings. Please listen to these important words from Irving Roth. I'm Irving Roth, Holocaust survivor and director of the Holocaust Resource Center here at Temple Judea in Manhasset, New York. It was a relatively nice night in May of 1944. I've been in a cattle car for three days and three nights. It was nighttime. The train stopped. Where was I? I was in Auschwitz. The train stopped. The doors were slid open. And suddenly, as I looked out, I saw guards with submachine guns screaming and yelling, heraus, mach schnell, get out quickly and take nothing with you. Behind me is my brother. After that, my grandfather grandmother, aunt, cousins. Ninety people disembarked in Auschwitz on that evening. As I looked further out, I saw chimneys, and out of chimneys, flames. What place is this? Where have I arrived? As we stood in formation and the line began to move, my grandfather and grandmother and aunt and 10-year-old cousin were separated from my brother and I. We went one way, a small group, in fact, to the left, a much larger group to the right. They were told they're going to take a shower and after which they're going to get a hot meal. But in reality, that night, they were murdered. And their bodies turned into ashes. That was the function of Auschwitz. 1.2 million human beings arrived in Auschwitz over the period of time of about two and a half years. 90% murdered and their bodies incinerated upon arrival. I stood in formation a number was tattooed on my arm and eventually marched out of this place called Auschwitz II or Birkenau to Auschwitz I, about two miles away, where I was assigned to work. So here I am, 14 and a half years old, living in a city. Suddenly, I'm working with horses, draining swamps and plowing the fields, knowing full well my grandfather, my grandmother, aunt, cousin, of the 4,000 people that arrived that night in Auschwitz, as few as 300 were still alive. The rest were ashes. How did I get there? What crime did I commit that I should be working from early morning to late at night on a very minimal diet? And my gentle, sweet grandfather murdered. All that because he was a Jew. How did all this happen? My first very solid recollection at the beginning of this was one morning in November of 1938. As every morning, my father would listen to the radio. And when I got up, I saw his face. It was ashen. I saw fear in his eyes, because on that morning, 30,000 Jews in Germany and Austria were arrested. Jewish stores looted. Synagogue, thousands of them burned to death. Will this happen to us too? That was the question. 
Unfortunately, as time went on, by 1939 spring, there was no country that I lived in called Czechoslovakia. It was now a new country called Slovakia, fashioned totally and completely on the model of Nazi Germany. The persecution of Jews began. It began very simply first. You can't go out at night. You cannot shop all day, only between designated hours. I can't go into the park. I must not go to the beach. And slowly, one injunctions again another. By the winter of 1939, I was told that I can no longer wear my jacket because the jacket is a sheepskin jacket and has fur inside. It's a luxury, and Jews are not allowed to have that. And so my jacket had to be turned over to the police department. My bicycle, our radio, all had to be turned over to the police department. They were all luxuries. Jews mustn't have it. And so went one law after another. And the newspaper had articles about how evil the Jews are. And they do not belong. In fact, it said on the bottom of the paper, in the front page, Slovakia is for Slovaks. And the article saying, the Jews don't belong. By 1940, September, I was still in school. I got up in the morning, the first day of school. It was a public school, but I went with Jews and Christians and Catholics and Protestants and gypsies living in a harmonious situation in the school as at home. But in September of 1940, I could no longer enter the school. No Jew was allowed to go to school. All Jewish students, whether they be kindergartners or college students, were thrown out of school. All Jewish teachers and professors were fired on that day. And so things get worse. And then comes a very important moment in my life, in the life of the family. My father had a lumber business. He produced railroad ties by the tens of thousands. But by 1940, Jews were no longer allowed to own a business. They were Aryanized, meaning no Jew was allowed to own it. And so my father in his wisdom decided that rather than wait until someone he doesn't know will take over his business, he asked one of his very good Christian friends, very close friend, to lend him his name and change the name of the company, transfer it over to his friend, and now, it was no longer a Jewish business. Now it was a Christian business. And we continued living financially the same way as before. A few months go by, and one day, my father's friend comes to his office, asks my father, Joe, how is business? Great, says my father. I really appreciate you lending me your name so I can continue running it and make a living. Well, that's what I came to talk to you about, said my father's friend. After all, the sign outside is mine. The stationery has my name on it. In fact, it is my business. But I'm very happy the way you are running it. And so you are the new manager. But understand, I'm the owner. The transformation of people, people we knew, friends, neighbors. When I was in school, in the public school, one of the students in my class lived a few houses away from me. She was a lovely, pretty girl, and I used to carry her books. But the end of 1939, she told me, she no longer wants me to carry her books. She, in fact, doesn't want to talk to me anymore, because I'm a Jew. Their father told her not to be friendly because it is socially unacceptable to be friendly with a Jew. And besides, the Jews 
are responsible for all the evil in the world. And so my life has changed. Still live in the same house, on the same street, but much more confined. I go to now to a Jewish school with Jewish teachers. And so goes the livelihood of the Jews of Slovakia. By 1941, Germany and its allies, in particular Hungary and Slovakia, invade the Soviet Union. We hear rumors that the Jews of the Soviet Union are being murdered. Obviously, it can't be true. How would a cultured, intellectual country do such things? Inconceivable. Didn't quite believe it. But from history, we know that by the time 1941 was over, over a half a million Jews of the Soviet Union were murdered. But the objective of the Nazi party was the total elimination of all Jews. And if you murder a half a million in six months, you get a million a year to get rid of all the Jews of Europe. It'll take 10 to 11 years. It's totally unacceptable. And so in January of 1942, there's a conference which takes place in a place called Wannsee outside of Berlin. The Brain Trust of Germany meets there. A single item on the agenda, how are we going to get rid of all the Jews of Europe, the shortest possible time at the least cost? Once it's introduced to this group of people, in 90 minutes, an hour and a half, they come up with a plan. The plan was simple. We'll build death camps. Bring the Jews there, murder them, burn their bodies, and all that's going to be left of the Jews will be smoke and ashes. We will solve the Jewish problem once and for all. So in the summer of 1942, in my little town in Slovakia, a town of 6,500 with about 2,000 Jews, that night, the summer of 1942, there's a knock on every Jew Jewish home. The Jews are marched into the synagogue. The synagogue is locked with guards outside. They're locked up there for 36 hours. After 36 hours, the doors are open. March to the railroad station, awaiting cattle cars, 1,800 out of the 2,000 Jews of my city are now in cattle cars being shipped. I was not. My whole family was spared the 1942 deportation, or action as it was called, because my father was still running Albert's business, the Christian business. He needed him. In fact, 10% of the Jewish population of my town was still there. With all the restrictions, what's going to happen to us? Is this a permanent situation or is this temporary? Didn't have to long, wait long. It's a matter of a few months. One morning, my grandparents were arrested. We actually managed to get them out. But we knew we are in trouble. We must leave. We must disappear. The gates of the world were not exactly open, but we managed to cross the border into Hungary. Hungary was a fascist country. Yet they decided to do something else with the Jews, not ship them out to be murdered. In 1941 already, they organized a slave labor force made up of Jewish men between the ages of 18 and 60, attach them to the army and off to the Russian front. They fixed the roads, built bridges, marched in front of tanks to find the mines. And this way, if a mine blew up, it blew up a Jew, but not the tank. That was much more valuable. 
And so by 1942 and 43, the Jews of Hungary, certainly the families, are at home. It's 1944. Germany is no longer in charge of the whole world. By the late 1943, beginning of 1944, Germany is beginning to lose the war. The Russian army has pushed them back already. They're already in Poland and Romania. The invasion of France is going to take place momentarily. And there's still hundreds of thousands of Jews. The only major Jewish population in all of Europe is in Hungary. In the spring of 1944, the Hungarian government, which was taken over by a Nazi group, decides it's time to get rid of the Jews of Hungary too. And so in 53 days, 437,000 Jews of Hungary are taken from their home, through a ghetto for a few days, into cattle cars, and that's how I arrived in Auschwitz in the spring of 1944. I celebrated my birthday, my 15th birthday in Auschwitz. No, there was no party. There was hardly any food. Hard work from early morning to late at night. I asked the world. I asked the freedom-loving, the good people of this world. Do not absorb their philosophy. Do not absorb their ideology. See what for what it is. Hatred. We must not allow this to happen. Yet, it is now 2020. 75 years after World War II was over. Hatred of the Jew. Anti-Semitism. Still is very pervasive. Even on a college system, both students and professors preach the hatred of the Jews, and the destruction of the Jewish state. I ask the good people of the world, don't let it happen again. We are indeed so privileged this evening to witness the current testimony of survivors uh, Irving Roth and Norbert Strauss, along with the archival survivor testimony from the USC Shoah Foundation. As Elie Wiesel taught us, and as we say frequently on the March of the Living, with regard to Holocaust survivor testimony, when you listen to a witness, you become a witness. The eyewitness testimony of each survivor includes essential stories for us to hear and from which we all pray the world will learn the lessons of the Holocaust. If you ask almost any survivor what their most fervent hope is, they will sum it up in a few words, peace, tolerance, justice, and respect for the dignity of each man, woman, and child on this earth. We are now pleased to welcome Happy Hoffman to sing O Se Shalom, a prayer for peace, and one of the most well-known Jewish liturgical pieces. Down. May the one, may the one who makes peace bring peace down, bring 
our last speaker this evening is Stefan Kramer, president of the State Agency for the Protection of the Constitution in Thuringia, Germany. The agency's task is to avert all efforts meant to harm the state of Thuringia, Germany, the free democratic basic order, and the German population on the state level in cooperation with the federal and other state agencies. The agency collects and analyzes information about extremist, terrorist, and any other efforts posing a threat to security and about foreign intelligence services activities directed against Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm speaking to you from the town of Erfurt, capital of the state of Thuringia in Germany, on the occasion of commemorating the so-called Kristallnacht of November 9th, 1938. While we undoubtedly need to remember the historical facts, I want to also turn your attention to the highly disturbing present developments. Neo-Nazis and white supremacists ideology is infiltrating parliaments, the military, the police and other public institutions also here in Germany these days. I want to thank my distinguished colleagues from the Miller Center at Rutgers University in New Jersey and friends from the International March of the Living for the chance to share my thoughts with you today. First of all, let me take you back in time. More than 13 years ago on July 15, 2007, we commemorated the seventh seas anniversary of the establishment of the Buchenwald concentration camp here in Thuringia. Former prisoners of the Buchenwald concentration camp warned against the trivialization of fascism, quote, the good beginnings of commemorating the victims of national socialism would be overshadowed by the global spread of war, nationalism and racism, quote, and said the then president of the International Buchenwald Dora Committee, Bertrand Herz, in Weimar, quote, the politicians, the historians and the fighters for the preservation of the commemoration still have a lot of work ahead of them so that the fertile womb can no longer give birth, quote, said Hertz also at this occasion. Quote, back then, 1945, we would never have dreamed that there were right-wing forces in Germany again today who dare and are allowed to demonstrate in our cities, end of quote, said Ottomar Rothman, who had been a political prisoner in Buchenwald from 1943 to 1945. Quote, the democratic rights guaranteed in the German constitution should not be a license to march by fascist groups, quote, end, said Rothman. As for myself, I took part in the event on behalf of the Central Council of Jews in Germany and spoke to the survivors and their families. I told them, we, the young generation, will take over the baton of remembrance and live up to the responsibility. That, my dear friends, was 13 years ago in 2007. And yes, I guess at the time I sort of could define myself as part of a relatively young generation. Today I'm speaking to you on the occasion of the commemoration of November 9th, 1938, and at a time when the Nazis are not only marching on the streets and chanting loudly, who's, who loves Germany is an anti-Semite. Rather, the new right sits in all state parliaments and in the Bundestag, the federal parliament. Yes, Europe in general has, has experienced an unprecedented shift to the right and a, res, a renaissance of nationalism. But Germany, the country which once planned and executed the Holocaust in such a hor horrifyingly thorough manner, must pay special attention to what is happening. Let's remember, it was exactly 82 years ago on November 9, 1938, that the Nazi regime launched its brutal, furiously destructive all-out attack against the Jews. On the night of November 9th to 10th, 1938, more than 1,200 synagogues and prayer rooms in Germany were set on fire, desecrated and destroyed. Among them, 23 synagogues in Thuringia alone. In 48 hours, more than 100 Jews were murdered in all of Germany and around 8,000 Jewish-owned businesses were looted. And KZ Buchenwald was one of the 980 concentration camps and more than 40,000 other camps of the Germans. The victims of these camps also included political opponents like Sinti and Roma and strangers to the community, including homosexuals, homeless people, Jehovah Witnesses and convicts, as well as Soviet prisoners of war. Namely, the need to remember the atrocities of the National Socialist murder machine 
and to commemorate their victims. It's about a necessary warning for the present and the future against the evil of the past, my friends. And members of parliament who, f who wear a blue cornflower on their lapels at memorial events and claim not to know what is used to be the secret identification mark of the Nazis who were banned in Austria between 1933 and 38. These are not derailments, my friends, but targeted provocations and transgressions. First provoke, then deny. That's the game. That shows the true face of these democratically elected representatives, and nobody should say later we have not seen or heard it. At this point, I would also like to remind you that although the lessons of the Nazi era were taken into account in to the German constitution in 1948, the basic consensus on real examination of the German past had not emerged in West Germany until the late 1980s. For this reason, I consider it essential to say on this day without ifs and buts, the memory of victims of the Nazi regime is and will remain an existential part of the German democratic self-image in our free society. Remembrance work is not a burden or a historical mortgage, but a task that must be passed on from generation to generation. Remembrance is an inner compass to defend human dignity and our freedom. There's more than one reason to commemorate. Of course, we owe it to the victims to keep them in honor of their memory. Letting them vanish into oblivion would be unforgivable. We also owe it to their family members, their descendants, to see their horrific fate as part of a collective memory. There is, however, as I said, another reason. Upholding this commemoration should be a self-interest of every democratic state based on human rights. Remembrance is part of our free democratic basic order in Germany. By remembering the darkest chapter in history, we remind ourselves that any slide into anti-democracy, xenophobia or racism is dangerous. We know where this is going. And it is not as if the unacceptable only begins when the situation reaches, reaches Nazi proportions, like between 1933 and 1945. The no-go zone of a democracy begins much earlier, and not only with a full-blown dictatorship. It begins where respect, not mere tolerance, for fellow human beings ends, where the basic values of democracy and the rule of law are called into question. The falsifiers of history and hushers ultimately strive for a different state. The burning desire to gloss over the Nazi era, indeed, if not to claim it had positive aspects, often goes hand in hand with a tendency towards violence. It is a fact that people who take an active stand against right-wing extremist hatred and racism feel threatened and intimidated even when they are not physically attacked. I think we can all vividly imagine what the racist hooligans, comrade in arms and Nazis think of memory of the Nazi victims. On Sunday, August 30th, 2020, the Reichstag in Berlin was stormed as protests against the nation's pandemic response grew. Hundreds of far-right activists waving the black, white and red flag of the pre-1918 German Empire, which once inspired the Nazis, broke through a police barrier and tried to force their way into the building. After a few minutes, the attack was over and police, though vastly outnumbered, managed to push the crowd back. The incident turned out to be a highly motivating success for the extreme right, challenging today's government once again. On social networks, right-wing extremists posted pictures of themselves and their weapons, calling for a storm on Berlin. My friends, technology plays a significant role. The protests would probably not be possible without the closed environments of Telegram channels and WhatsApp groups. And they are unthinkable without YouTube's algorithm, which keeps showing you more and more of the same once you have watched one video. Also, the US conspiracy theory QAnon goes global and is thriving in Germany. It has found fertile ground in the putsch fantasies and anti-Semitic tropes long popular on Germany's far-right fringe. The extreme right is delighted. Recently, a high-ranking AFD a federal staff member was taped secretly by a TV channel, Pro7, in conversation where he emphasized that Germany has to get worse in order to promote the support for the far-right AFD among the people. 
quote, immigrants and refugees who come to Germany could later be shot or gassed in order to handle the problem, unquote. Over the last 14 months, far-right terrorists have assassinated a regional conservative politician on his front porch near the city of Kassel because he supported immigration and attacked a synagogue in Halle in eastern Germany, killing ordinary citizens on the street. In February, terrorists killed 10 people in Hanau. Even before the pandemic hit Germany, far-right extremism and far-right terrorism had been officially identified as the biggest danger to German democracy. For years, in opposition to that, it had been belittled and neglected as a possible threat, although we had more than 500 murders by right-wing perpetrators since the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. At the same time, senior intelligence officers today express concern about far-right extremists infiltrating German security services. Cases of far-right extremists in the military and in the police some hoarding weapons and explosives have multiplied in the last years. It's not just hoarding material for the day X, but actively preparing with logistics and safe houses for undercover operations, such as kidnapping and killing government officials and political opposition representatives. Lists of possible targets have been found. I know that is not new, especially to our friends in the United States, but it's new to us here in Germany. In July, the federal government disbanded an entire unit of the German Special Forces Brigade, the KSK, because it was infested with far-right extremists. German Federal President Steinmeier described the situation as follows, quote, far-right extremism has deep roots in our society. It is a serious danger, end of quote. To many people, defamation, hatred, and violence are once again part of the legitimate means of political debate. Xenophobic and nationalist statements are enjoying increased approval and confidence in the functionality of democracy is falling noticeably. My friends, if we want to effectively fight racism for the future and save our democracies, then we must convincingly convey to our citizens and children that no matter what sexual, ideological, cultural, social, religious or other differences we might have, we as human beings have the same rights, feel, think and suffer alike. Responsible politics for a society means not to steer up resentments and prejudices, but to reduce them. It means treating one another with the same respect and responsibility, relearning to have compassion for one another and to be curious about one another. My friends, knowledge alone does not immunize against misanthropy. We also need empathy. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, we're in political uncertain times and it is not uncommon for many today, at least here in Germany, to feel reminded of the times of crisis in the Weimar Republic. But optimism, my friends, all alone will not lead us to open societies, a democratic and bright future. The Weimar Republic failed at the time, not because of too many Nazis, but because of too few Democrats who took to the streets to fight for their democracy. We should seriously consider that today. Thank you for attention. And let me end with uh, Leolam Loot, Am Israel Chai. Thank you so much. Bye. As we conclude tonight's important and moving Kristallnacht commemoration, and on behalf of the International March of the Living and each of its partner organizations, we thank you for having joined us tonight. And we thank each of you for your own commitment to learning the lessons of the Holocaust and to building a better world for all people, for our children and for their children. Our closing song comes from Psalms 89.3 and will be performed by Cantor Aviva Reisky. The word chesed means loving kindness and is a value shared by all of the world's great religions. The melody and English words were written by Rabbi Menachem Creditor. The lyrics call upon all of us to create a world built on kindness, which is surely a fitting message with which to close this evening's proceedings. 
as you listen to these words, reflect on the past. Remember Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Remember how lives were destroyed. People were killed. Businesses were burned. Family and community were destroyed and torn asunder. The fiber and fabric of the community, the Jewish community of Europe was literally destroyed. We should have seen what was coming next. The world should have recognized that the night of broken glass was the beginning. But no one could have imagined the evil that would come in the end. Death, destruction, murder, disregarding of the value of human life, the destruction of people, the destruction of their families, the destruction of life. But we have survived and together we remember the past. Together we honor the survivors. Together let us listen to the words. Olam chesed yibane la da 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 La da da la da 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 Oh, I'm just a La da 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 Oh, I'm just a I will build this world from love. La da da, la da 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 da. You will build this world from love. La da da. La da da, la da da, da da da.